evening, may I introduce to you Linda Rose, CEO of Voice for Justice UK. This woman is a firebrand. I'll tell you that now. She speaks truth. And she unapolog unapologetically speaks truth without fear of favour. And when you listen to her, people do take notice. That's for sure. So, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce Linda Rose, CEO of Voice of Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm almost scared to stand up now. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was asked if I wanted to use a microphone. My dentist tells me I have a very small mouth. <laughs> My husband tells me I have quite a big mouth. <laughs> so I thought I'd try it without. But if you can't hear me, just wave a finger. Okay, and we will, we will adjust things. Um, it's a great day today. Steve, thank you so much for organising this. And it really is a great pleasure to, to be here. And I, I think this sort of day is so important because it's a message that needs to go out. And I say needs, I'm not just saying we need to be nice, we need to get this message out. It needs to go out to the church. Mm. We talk a lot about social contagion these days. We need social contagion for having the guts to talk about this. Mm -hmm. So the more events like this we can have, the more we go from here and we actually meet with other people and actually say, this is where there's going to be a huge benefit because we are in a spiritual battle yeah. in this nation. Yeah. And we have, we have got before God to engage with it. I was wondering when uh, I heard, um, well we all did, Steve introduced the last couple of speakers and he said, now we're coming to the caring part of the day. <laughs> and how we, uh, you know, look after women. I thought, huh? <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't want to sound flippant, and this really, uh, just to repeat what other speakers have said, in talking about abortion, there is nothing in this about condemning people. It could be me, it could be you, and we know that, you know, a lot of people have had abortions. But actually, the fact of abortion, we're all sinners. Oh, okay? yeah. I wish I could say, we're the redeemed, we're perfect. <laughs> that would be so nice, but it's not true. <laughs> we are all sinners. And we know before God that if we, if we refuse to recognize the sin, there is no healing. Because it's like, putting ourselves in this little room. We're Christians, but we stand this door shut, and Christ is standing there saying, you know what, I really love you, and I really want to heal you, but you're not letting me in. Mm -hmm. And actually for all of us, we have got to let come in, and God come in and touch the, the difficult places, because that's where healing is, and that's why one of the reasons why we have to get this message out to the church. But hmm, what I'm going to be doing here is actually, um, I'm kind of broadening what we've been looking at today. So I'm looking at the effects of abortion, but also God's take on abortion, and I realise here at the community because none of us know the mind of God, but there are certain things that he has said in scripture and is so clear, and I think that without any shadow of doubt at the moment, we are facing very difficult times in the world globally. Now a lot of people have said it's judgment. Actually, I would say, no, it's, it's not judgment, because I think judgment is really, really terrible. But I think this is the warning that God has withdrawn his hand of protection at this time. And he's saying, you know what? You've chosen this, chosen this, get on with it. And that's what we're seeing. 
And if we want him to help, and he wants to help, he really, really does. God's will is to save. God, I have no words. He loves us so much. He wants to come in. But he won't while we persist in rebellion. Because if we were in a little room with our sin, this is actually being in a fortress with moats and goodness knows what. Yeah. And it's saying, you know what, God, go away, we can handle it. And God, because he's terribly blunt, he says, okay, you think you can handle it? Get on with it. That's where we are. And that's why we need to repent of abortion. There are other things we need to repent of too, of course, but abortion is major. I'm going to try and fit this in context here in the next few minutes. Um, okay, just thinking. I was talking to Christian earlier and he said to me, um, how do you feel about Roe and Wade? Excited? And I said, mm. Mm. <laughs> Okay, everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say run away. Yeah, 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 yes. Just a few reactions that we've had. Nicola Sturgeon took to Twitter as soon as the uh, Supreme Court announced their judgment in Dodds in Chicago, and she tweeted, The right of women to decide what happens to our own bodies is a human right. And I thought you'd have done that in a Scottish accent, but I didn't so I'm not even going to try. A little bit later, she said, This is one of the darkest days for women's rights in my lifetime. Ooh. The Times. Janice Turner, one of their comments. I quite like Janice Turner, actually. But anyway, she, uh, she wrote in the article, The Morning After Rowan Maid. Reproductive autonomy is the fundamental woman's right, without which all other rights and achievements are worthless. <laughs> Demanding women carry unwanted babies is about patriarchal control. <laughs> Gosh, well, could you tell us straight, please, Janice? I'm not quite picking up on this. <laughs> And amazingly, this is a view that is even shared by some people in the church. It's over the same paper. Uh, this is a Church of England priest called Lizzie Green, who was quoted describing the decision as deeply, deeply wrong. And she went on to say, wait for it, abortion saves lives. Oh, oh. <laughs> Over in the US, we've seen the um, very mixed um, reaction, actually, of the uh, uh, American church. But Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of yeah. the Episcopal Church, said, I am deeply grieved. Yeah. And he has pledged himself to, to fight to get this terrible decision turned back. Mm. Now, it's really interesting, because actually, Ray Wade, I'm sure you're aware of this, it has not made abortion illegal in the United States. If you actually read the judgment in, in Dobbs, it's actually fairly mutual because all it says is there is no constitutional right to abortion and it is not the function of judges or the courts to decide it and they have put it back to the legislatures to decide democratically. And the people within each legislature, legislature, I've always had difficulty pronouncing that mm -hmm. word, they have been democratically elected from the people within that state. Now, I don't know about you, but wouldn't you think that any right minded person in the West would think, gosh, that's so good? Democracy. Give people the right to choose for themselves. But apparently it only works one way. It's only a right if you actually exercise it in line with what they want. Mm -hmm. And the response that we've seen in the States and pretty well worldwide is just pure vitriol. 
rage, hatred, disgust, frustration, fill in all the rest of the adjectives that you were studying in ecology. But the effect actually is completely extraordinary. And I think it shows more clearly than anything I could say to you, but it shows the reality of the spiritual battle that we're in. Because this is out of all, it's way over the top. You know, this, this is way beyond what you would expect just because some decision has been overturned. This is a battle between light and dark, between God and the devil. And that brings us to abortion. Because abortion actually is absolutely, it's the linchpin for the whole thing. Because by claiming this right to kill the unborn, we, we are sacrificing them on the altar of self, as uh, Dave reminded us. What we're actually doing there is worshipping the devil. And I will go on a bit and I'll explain this in, in more detail, because I know that's a little bit of a, an out there kind of statement that shocks people. But we are worshipping the devil in sanctioning abortion. The right to kill the unborn legitimizes casual sex mm -hmm. and it throws wide open the door to immorality. We talk about, you know, we've lost our moral compass in this nation. Are you surprised? Because we have let things in by this. And we need to take this very seriously because don't ever make any mistake. Don't let anybody persuade you otherwise. God sees and he cares. And he will not, because he cannot, tolerate sin. Because sin separates us from him. It puts up a huge barrier. And it puts us under bondage to death and the devil. This is why God won't tolerate sin. Not because he's nasty. Not because he thinks, Ugh! Look at that, not enjoying themselves. I'm not having that. <laughs> no. God cannot tolerate sin because it separates us, it kills us, it consigns us to hell. And it's because of all of our wrong choices. And there have been a lot of wrong choices made over the last century, when you think about it. Some made deliberately, but often actually made in ignorance. And a lot of people in this world, they're not evil. They're really not. They haven't got a clue that they're actually making decisions. But you try telling that to the devil. He thinks they've made decisions. And what we've done is we have put them, put ourselves under bondage. And this is why evil has grown so strong in this world over the last decade. It's why we're seeing this headlong plunge into chaos. See, every day gets worse. We've had this, haven't we? You know, Boris Johnson this, this week going, and now they're all sort of snapping around who's going to be the next leader. And it's just... It's total chaos. We're just attacking each other all the time. The bottom line is that unless we do now urgently repent of these lives that we've so casually destroyed, these lives that are so completely dependent on us, that were God's gift, unless we repent, we will face judgment. And that is infinitely worse than anything that we're going through at the moment. And that is in this life and in the life to come. Mm. God will return. I don't know if we really are in the last days now. I kind of suspect privately we might be, but I might be wrong. And actually it's not... It's not my business, it's not my affair. This is God's business. It's, 
not my interest, it's just... But whether he comes almost immediately, or whether he's actually going to shape the nations to bring out a remnant, I don't know. But I do know that in what is going on now, it is vitally important that we are faithful. And that we, you know, we're lucky because we know the Lord. We know that we're saved. Okay, we're not good. We're not, we've got a few some rough pieces, places we've still got to get to work on. But we know that we're saved. And we know that by his grace and in his love, we know where we're going to go. But a lot of people don't have that knowledge. Because they've been told that God doesn't exist, he doesn't matter. He's some fairy in the sky. He's okay for the weak-minded who kind of need that. They don't need it fine because they, you know, they, they, they've got it sorted. No. It is for their sakes that we have to be faithful. And I honestly believe that we are in the business of building a little ark and of going out to rescue people under his direction. So, why is abortion so bad? I mean, I'm just going to just um, hear everything. Everybody said today, well, let's just have a look at this. We'll have broader pictures. It's just a clump of cells, isn't it? It's, it's not a baby till it's, till it's born. And you know what? I mean, of course a woman has a right to decide what happens to her own body. I mean, get real. How can you dare to tell me what to do? And if a woman doesn't want to pay host to a parasite for nine months, what's it got to do with you to make her? Hmm. Now, these are all the arguments that the abortion campaigners want you to believe because they're so, they're caring and they're so reasonable and rational. And at every level, they are wrong. Hmm. Just let me remind you, and I'm going to repeat things that people have said today already, but I'm going to repeat them because I'm you know, putting them in a broader thing here. From the moment of conception, from the exact second that the sperm joins with the ovum, there is a human being, a new human being there with their own unique DNA. A complete genetic package is there. There's nothing going to be added from that minute. Nothing that needs to be taken away so that it just kind of grows a bit better. All that has to happen is that that tiny little fertile cell has to grow and develop. But it's a human being. And you know what? Throughout life, we are growing and developing. To the minute we die, we are developing in some way. God has a purpose for us. So if you're going to say, well, okay, we can afford a baby because it's not yet out in the open air, whatever. Actually, you can, you have, if you're claiming the right to kill anybody, why should you not kill a two-year-old child because they're really being such a nuisance and you can't take these endless broken nights anymore? What's to say? They're a human being? Why are they so much more of a human being than a baby? Or somebody in a coma? Well, okay, they're a human being. They're pretty useless now, you know. So you just turn the machines off right now. If you sanction abortion, you're actually opening the door to teaching, treat, sorry, yeah, treating men and women in a completely utilitarian way. There is no sanctity involved. The Bible says that life begins at conception. But it actually goes even further. If you think in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, God says to the prophet, 
kind of suspect a little bit to his horror, actually. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. That's not just Jeremiah. That same idea is repeated time and again throughout Scripture. Who? A few examples. Samuel. John the Baptist. Jesus, as Dave reminded us. Paul. Psalm 139. Without exception, Scripture says that every child is special and known to God from before conception. Every child is loved by God. Adolf Hitler was loved by God. Genghis Khan was loved by God. Every child is loved. And every child has a unique destiny that only they can fulfill. Now again, I know some people say, well, some people's destiny is pretty evil. It might be better if it hadn't been born. But just think of all those lives, of the gifts that humanity has been deprived of. Because it's, it's a problem. I'm not so worried actually about the unborn children that were aborted because God loves them and He put them in His care. But I am very worried about us and where we are. So every child is special, every child has a destiny, but the Bible says two other things that are actually very important. First off, it prohibits, without any exception, the taking of innocent life. Now that's actually key, because sometimes people confuse, um, they, they see an absolute prohibition on taking life. The Bible actually is clear, it says taking innocent life which it labels murder. And I'm not going to get into the whole, you know, analysing what's in its life and what isn't. But for our purposes, what's important is that when you take innocent life, it brings this murder and it carries severe penalties and it places the perpetrator under a curse. And we get that right from the beginning of scripture. Genesis chapter 4, verse 11. Cain slays Abel, and God says to him, Now you are cursed from the ground. It will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And think about this. Abortion is taking the innocent life of another human being. It's almost worse because this it is innocent life that commands protection because it's in the womb. And it commands respect because it's made in the image of God. So it almost needs more care than anybody else. But abortion, because it is murder, and I know that a lot of them, there's been a lot of press recently of the people saying these terrible religious fundamentalists calling about abortion murder. You know what, it's time for us to stand up and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop being so apologetic about this, because the Bible actually says it is murder. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it places those involved under a curse. Not just the mother and father, so don't just think, Phew, that's all right, I've been let off. All of society comes under that same shadow because we have all been complicit. I know that you know for years people have been working to try and stop these laws, but actually, at the end of the day, we have allowed this to happen. So we all bear responsibility in some way. Our acceptance and our endorsement of abortion as a human right, and again, some more of this in coming days, this places the land under a curse. And okay, the secular world will say, well, dear me, those nuts are at it again. 
Well, fine. Okay, but I would say to them, look around. Because we've had COVID and it's not going to go away. You know, they still um, keep hoping it's going to, but it seems to come back again. We, they tell us we're in another wave at the moment. We're facing economic collapse, global economic collapse. We've got a cost of living crisis here in this country. We've got threats of world famine now because of what's happening over in Ukraine. We've got um, terrible droughts, climate change, and that's another issue which I'm not going to get into. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got so many problems. Where do they think all this is coming from? You know, in Jeremiah, which I've been reading through recently, so I'm kind of influenced by Jeremiah at the moment, um, he kept warning the people that it was because of their sin that God was going to unleash an army from the north. And they laughed at him. They said, oh, no, get real. He's not going to do that. We'll be okay. We'll just go off for another sacrifice in the temple. That's fine. They stopped laughing when they got to Babylon. That's where we are today. There's more, there's more. The Bible goes on. <laughs> it's not just that we're killing an unborn child. We're actually sacrificing that child. Now the Bible explicitly forbids child sacrifice. Leviticus 18, verse 21, you shall not give any of your offspring to sacrifice unto Moloch. And so profane the name of your God. Now we need to think about this a little bit because it's very important. Why was this so bad? And how on earth did sacrificing children, let's face it, they don't contribute much, do they? How did this profane God? We need to look at sacrifice because sacrifice in the pagan world had huge. <laughs> spiritual significance and power. It was made in an attempt to please or appease or to feed the spirit to whom it was made. Now, again, there is a time to go into the whole sacrifice here, but blood sacrifice in the ancient world was felt to be especially powerful. Actually, in some regions of the world today, it's still felt to be especially powerful. But the reason was that blood was seen as sacred. It carried the life force. It was a seat of life. <coughs> so sacrifice was transactional. On the one hand, but the people making it because they want to influence uh, this spirit to achieve certain ends or objectives. They want favour. And they get that by transferring some power that they've got to this demonic spirit on the other side, which needs to be fed. The outpouring of blood feeds the demon to whom it is being made. What's that got to do with abortion? Woman's right to choose what she does with her own body. Yes, that's fine. The baby is another human being entrusted to the womb of its mother. Babies are developed enough to survive. The choice to end that life is made to really just to allow us to continue. Our hedonistic lifestyles, our choices. Abortion is actually sacrificing that child to the great God self. And that's our big God in this day and age. We've got a new religion. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. It's me. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want wherever I want, with whomsoever I want, with no commitment, no consequences, unless I decide I want those consequences. 
It's got a different name, but it's actually worship of Satan. And that's, this is the crux of the problem here. It's because of this worship that we've given over the last century that the demonic spirit behind sexual immorality and death, and we have got a culture of death now, it's because of this sacrifice that this spirit has grown so strong and that we've seen such an explosion of things like sexual license, promiscuity, pornography, and this utter contempt for human life. It's not just in the womb. It's going all the way through now. We're seeing another push at the moment for assisted suicide. It is complete contempt for life. It is a culture of death. And we have fed it by the worship that we have given through abortion. Now, the numbers for abortion over the last 50 years have been absolutely horrific. And uh, Dave did uh, mention this um, very comprehensively, but in 1967, when David Steele introduced what was called the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Bill, it sounds quite innocuous, though, doesn't it? Mm. He said, we want to step out the backstreet abortions, but it is not the intention of the promoters of the bill to leave a wide open door for abortion on request. Cherubi mm. noble of him. He went on to say that he thought that at most there would be maybe at the outside 300 abortions a year. I mean, we can live with that, can't we? Because it's being nice. It, it, it's, you know, it's healthy. That's something we do have major problems. I, I don't want to belittle the problems. So you can say, okay, it was healthy. Fine. Last year, the number of babies aborted was around 214,300. Uh, they had the ones from the year before. It was uh, 2010, isn't it? So that's gone up by 4,500. It's the highest number since records began. Largely thanks to telemedicine, which again we've heard a lot about today. And of course, we know that one in four conceptions now end in abortion. Now, if you want to round up figures, in England and Wales alone since 1967, we will hit 10 million abortions this autumn. Now, actually, that is pretty much an underestimate, because what that fails to take into account is the morning after pill, which has been doled out like smartest for the last couple of years. And we do know that some girls are, I don't know, they're taking you know, two or three of these a month. It, it, it is absolutely horrendous. We've, we've seen some frightening statistics coming in. None of these get counted in abortion statistics. Of course, we don't know if they're actually pregnant. But you can be absolutely certain that a pretty high number of them would have been pregnant. So actually, the 10 million figure that we've got is a gross underestimate. And it is so shocking, though, that of that 10 million, the 98% are just for social reasons. Because you know, we, all, we all dress it up, we all find excuses for what we do, but what that actually means is just that the baby wasn't wanted, it's a problem, it wasn't the right time. You try telling that to a baby, it's not personal, but I'm just going to terminate you now because it's not right. Okay, thanks, Mum. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, that does not hold good. This is bad in the UK, but you look globally at what's been going on. I find this really shocking. Over the last century, at a conservative estimate, and this is me, this is the official statistics. We've aborted between 1.5 to 2 billion children. Now, again, the number might actually be a lot higher. As I said, this is a conservative estimate. Okay, question. Hands up. Who can tell me how big is the world population? Just under 8 billion. Sorry? Just under 8 billion. Just under 8 billion? Yeah. Okay. Then. Nine and a half, ten billion. Nine and a half, ten billion. Billion, yeah. Eight. Eight? 
Okay, well, yeah, eight is closest. It's actually 7.7 billion. Now, I'm not a mathematician, as my husband will tell you. I'm actually dreadful at maths. <laughs> but what this means is that we have aborted to the equivalent of around 7% of the human race. Isn't that extraordinary? This is rebellion against God. Yes. This is demonic. 25%. Oh, thank you. They said I'm absolutely useless. Yes. It's 25%. It's huge, isn't it? I mean, it's absolutely frightening. You know, people talk about abortion figures. I, I, I think the no, I think he's correct. I think the number of one in four applies globally and has applied for, for, the, for the whole of this century, you know, for 34 yes. years at least. Up to 67, you can agree. Yeah. One in four of viable pregnancies, regardless of location, have ended in induced abortion. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it's actually heartbreaking, isn't it? It is, really? yeah. You know, so. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's not, this isn't a little problem. This isn't no. just a, a few girls who maybe acted unwisely or maybe have a problem just having an abortion. This is actually. Now do you see why this is such a problem? Now do you see why we need urgently to repent? Do you see why the church has got to wake up, not in judgment, but to come before God and just beg his forgiveness? Because this is why we're seeing this complete disintegration of of order and peace and yeah. stability. Yeah. The world is bedeviled at this time. And it's a result of our choices, our rebellion. Well, that's probably, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, how are you doing? One more thing, very quick. Um, Voice for Justice is, um, has been pulling together other groups and organisations just recently because we have felt the Lord is calling us to call a day of prayer in this nation. And we're very much influenced by the days of prayer in the Second World War that were seen in retrospect as absolutely pivotal. You know, Dunkirk, church was told we'd be lucky if we saved 30,000. George VI called a day of prayer. He saved 338,000. And it enabled us to go on. The Battle of Britain, we were on our last legs. We would not have survived if Hitler, completely inexplicably, hadn't suddenly diverted the Luftwaffe to the Russian front. It followed a day of prayer. And there are lots, lots more. It is the Lord... The Lord hears and he responds. And we feel it is urgent that this nation gathers together in prayer. Now, whether people will respond or not, I don't know, because this is between them and it's actually up to God. But we will be calling this day. And I really hope, Greg, that you will, because it's, we're not organising an event. We don't want an event. It's not that. We're calling people to pray. So we're calling uh, church leaders to host a day of prayer, calling people to gather in their homes just to get their friends together to pray. But we'd like to mobilise as far as we can this nation because it honestly is our only hope mm -hmm. of escaping what lies ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm.